was uh, born in Chicago, Illinois on April 7th, 1931. So I just turned 72. Great. And, uh, uh, let me just give a little prelude. Um, I'm talking with Daniel Ellsberg, and he uh, will be talking about his involvement in the 1978 uh, Rocky Flats protest, as well as other things. And uh, this is an oral history for the Carnegie Library and for the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum. And the date today is uh, April 13th, 2003. And this is Dorothy Charlo. Thank you very much. Okay. So, well, you... really what brought me to Rocky Flats in 1978 was basically a lifelong, almost lifelong concern for avoiding nuclear war. And that had led me to some strange places uh, in the course of my life, including shaping U.S. general war nuclear plans. At a time when I thought that we needed deterrence from the Russians, from the Soviets, and that the best way of avoiding an all-out nuclear war was to deter the Soviets from launching a surprise nuclear attack. It was in that spirit that I went to the Rand Corporation from Harvard in 1958 for the summer, and then in particular that I joined them permanently in 1959, at the height of what was known as the Missile Gap, when it was believed that the Soviets were in a crash effort to develop ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, with H-bomb warheads with which to uh, uh, disarm the United States of its ability to retaliate and to take over the world, essentially, by destroying the United States. So with great urgency, I spent 59 and 60, seven days a week, really, uh, at least part of every Sunday, helping, uh, trying to decide, uh, define how to um, protect our strategic air command from a disarming attack. In 1961, late 61, I learned at a level higher than top secret in the Pentagon that the Soviets had exactly four ICBMs at a time when we had 40 going on hundreds and thousands. And at that time, we actually had some 200 intermediate range missiles in range of Russia. They had none within range of us. And um, they, they were threatening Europe, but not the United States. We had uh, some 2,000 uh, strategic bombers, plus about another 1,000 tactical bombers in range of Russia. They had 198 bombers in range of the United States. So there was an enormous gap in striking ability, but it was 10 to 1 and more on our favor. I'd been working, in effect, uh, in support of, or desperately, uh, to fight off an illusion. It was a, a hoax, essentially. To some degree, a, a mistake. But it was a mistake that wasn't too easy to see through uh, from the perspective, say, of the Army and Navy. But we worked for the Air Force and uh, were fully subject to this illusion. I believe you have been in the Marines yourself, is that right? <clears throat> yes, I'd really chosen the Marines as a service after having been deferred, and I felt I sh during the Korean War that it was my duty to take others had gone in my place in Korea. Now the war was essentially over in 54, but I did feel that I owed years of service. So I chose the Marines in significant part because they didn't threaten nuclear weapons. Uh, they, uh, I didn't want to work for the Air Force, though in the end, ironically, I did end up working for the Air Force. But in the service, I chose the Marines as people who fought soldiers, not civilians, and did not rely on nuclear weapons, even though at that time, even the Marines had some nuclear weapons for their 10-inch howitzers, some of their airplanes. <coughs> but uh, didn't. It was just to be one of the family. The, um, I heard in early 1978 my trial for having given the Pentagon Papers having ended in 1973 and the war had ended in 1975. Uh, almost immediately then, as soon as the war had ended, I set to work trying to help build a movement against nuclear weapons comparable to the movement against the Vietnam War that might ultimately even cut off the money for the arms race the way that Congress had eventually cut off the money for the Vietnam War, and that was how the war got ended. So I worked from 76 on and 77 
a group called the Mobilization, came to be called the Mobilization for Survival. Before that, a continental walk across the country for peace and social justice, but actually aimed at, uh, at abolition of nuclear weapons, or initially at ending the arms race. In 1978, or late, perhaps it was late 77, I learned that President Carter, Democratic President Carter, had authorized the de production and deployment of neutron bombs, small H-bombs that would kill mainly by radiation. I'd known of these for a long time because the inventor of the neutron bomb, the so-called father of the neutron bomb, was a man named Sam Cohen, a physicist at RAND. And he had asked my opinion when I was at RAND in the late 50s uh, what the uses of his weapon would be. Uh, that was the kind of thing I did. I knew nothing about the physics of it, but I was good at analyzing the role this would take play in, in uh, adversarial relations. I wrote my PhD thesis in part on bargaining theory, for example. And I told Sam, to his uh, dismay, that I thought this bomb was good for nothing but starting nuclear wars, that it was the most dangerous weapon that had yet been invented because it was the most usable, allegedly usable bomb, which was just what he liked about it. That's what he designed it for against tank formations, even conceivably against cities where it would kill the inhabitants of structures or buildings without actually demolishing the structures. Uh, I just heard it said uh, by, I think, Ari Fleischer. No, it was, uh, actually by, um, of all people, Tom Brokaw, not an official member of the government, working for NBC, who had said that we did not plan this time, as we did a dozen years ago in Baghdad, to destroy waterworks and electricity and health projects directly because, quote, we would be owning the city within a few days. Actually, it took a bit longer. But I did think they did use rather discriminate targeting on the whole. And nowadays, they would want to use neutron bombs in this situation and not level the age-old city, just rid it of its uh, resistant uh, people and their families. Unfortunately, the collateral damage. I insert here that uh, we're talking at a time when <coughs> everyone's mind is very much on the uh, war in Iraq yeah. that is on ground. That's right. I am uh, very happy that Baghdad fell without much of a fight. Uh, some, we don't know how many people died yet. Probably numbered in the hundreds, though, rather than the thousands. It could have been very different. Our troops, U.S. troops and U.K. troops, are now advancing on Tikrit, the second largest city, where Iraqi troops are said to have retreated for a perhaps final battle. I hope very, very much that they lay down their arms, that they melt into the civilian population as they apparently did in Baghdad. Because, and I hope above all, that Saddam or his successors do not have or use poison gas or biological weapons. We have threatened, the U.S. has threatened in their name, I say we, the U.S., the President uh, and the Vice President and Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, have threatened explicitly that we're prepared to use nuclear weapons if poison gas should be used against our troops. I don't think that's purely a bluff. And if that happens, bombs whose triggers were made at Rocky Flats I believe may well be used in Iraq and start an era in which nuclear weapons are not just threatened but are exploded on people. And that will be catastrophic for our species to start that process. Uh, a further dangerous stage in this uh, epic, this, this arc of destruction, self-destruction we've been on here for the last 50 years and more. Now, uh, this could happen, in other words, any day. And indeed... Definitely, the, the triggers would have been made at Rocky Flats, since they were all made at Rocky Flats. They're probably going to find a new place now that Rocky Flats has so contaminated the area that they really can't work in it anymore. But Livermore, near my hometown, or a lot more likely Los Alamos, perhaps Pantex in Texas, will make new triggers for the bombs that this administration wants to test, new bombs. There'll be new triggers. But the up till now, the bombs that would be used would have been triggered by Rocky Flats. Now, when I came in 19, when I heard first that the neutron bomb was going to be deployed then, I felt this is the bomb that can start 
nuclear wars because we use them on tanks, we use them on cities or whatever. The Soviets didn't have neutron bombs as far as I know and their reply would not be with neutron bombs, it would be with regular H-bombs and A-bombs. <laughs> and we would reply then with our H-bombs and A-bombs. So the, the phase of neutron bomb warfare would, I feel, not be very long. It would just be the match that lights the thermonuclear war. The way that the trigger at Rocky Flats is lit by high explosive and then in turn, having imploded, lights the fusion fuel uh, installed at Pantex for an explosion up to a thousand times more lethal than the Nagasaki bomb. Now, when I arrived, I, I keep coming to this point and then I have to go back. I heard the neutron bomb was gonna be deployed and I, I decided, even though I had a child, a baby, almost one year old, and had promised my wife that I would be with her and her partner and help her during this period of infancy and childhood, uh, I felt I had to break that promise because I had to spend my time somehow doing what I could to warn people about this bomb wherever I could, that it should not, must not be deployed. Uh, what helped was a, a very widespread opinion in Europe that was opposed to this deployment. But the states had agreed with Carter that uh, they would accept the deployment of these neutron bombs in Germany and elsewhere, although there was large protest in Germany about it. In this country, there wasn't much of an anti-nuclear movement then. I was in, in helping out with what there was, but there wasn't a lot. And I heard that there was going, to, there had been an educational project here under um, Sister Pam Solo and Judy Danielson, I think of AFSC, that had been educating people for a couple of years at this point to what they call the local hazard global risk, uh, the name of their brochure, that had been talking to people at the plant and people in Denver and explained to them what the risks were of this uh, nuclear arms race and the local risks of contamination or accident. So I forget whether they invited me first or I invited myself. I think they called me up. And, uh, but I, I quickly agreed that I would come and do some preliminary publicity for the rally they had scheduled for April 29th. And I agreed that I would be part of the rally. So you, they asked you to speak? Yeah, they asked me to speak, but they also asked me to come earlier, I think in, in March, if I, as I recall, and uh, do some interviews that would prepare people and get people out to the rally. And although they had been working very well and their brochure was terrific, for over a year and a half, I think two years or so at this point, I found that in every program I was on in, in Denver, and I was on most of the talk shows, your morning shows, morning shows, not one of these people who had agreed to interview me were aware what Rocky Flats did, which was showed a considerable limitation of uh, up to that point of the outreach of this program. Efficient, these people were really good, but nobody knew. And I remember in particular one interviewer saying, well, why are you against nuclear power? And I said, do you know what they do at Rocky Flats? She said, well, isn't it a nuclear power plant? Which was what everybody thought actually. And uh, I said, the only power they produce at Rocky Flats is the power to end life on Earth, or in smaller quantities, millions and millions of deaths. And that was news to people. So my, my little outreach here on the uh, television did make a difference, in other words, uh, as I found it you know, on the radio and television. And uh, then I went off. I, I did neutron bomb rallies in Amsterdam and I lobbied in Norway. I, I was all over Europe and a lot in England <coughs> and uh, uh, even had the feeling that I was, ha in some cases, was having some effect. I was a, a well-known figure at that point because my trial had just ended in 1973, as I say. And uh, so uh, I probably had in some ways in those days, uh, well, you had a, more of a movement at this point in Europe than you had in this country. And then I came back for the April 29th rally here. And I remember that the uh, <laughs> rally was a, was a very hot day, April 29th, and I was waiting to speak. And it was so hot uh, listening to the speakers that I, I didn't have any uh, hat. And I, need, I don't normally wear a hat. So I went across the square to a Stetson store and bought a, a Stetson, rather expensive 
but it was the only kind of sun hat they had, came back just to keep the sun off. And I mentioned that because, of course, then we walked out to the site for the, I think there had been a day earlier of uh, education on nonviolence training. And they had explained, which I took part in, and they explained um, uh, the procedures of consensus and the rules of nonviolence and all this. And at that point, this wasn't all that familiar to me because uh, although I'd been on trial for, under indictment for two years and, and uh, five months in court, uh, facing a possible 115 years sentence. I hadn't been, um, I think I'd been arrested once at this point, and that wasn't until, aside from the for first time, <laughs> for 115 years possible sentence, so that was kind of a large first step. But the, the first actual civil disobedience action was, uh, I think, 76, uh, you know, three years after my trial on the steps of the Pentagon. I think that was my first arrest that I remember. Um, so it hadn't been so long before. And that was in a, this continental walk action against nuclear weapons. <clears throat> so I, I didn't, had, hadn't had a lot of nonviolence training and so forth. And all this was, was quite interesting to me and the question of arrest procedures and all that. So you were planning, that. going through that, you were planning to participate in this. In yes, well, uh, well, they said, they didn't emphasize that it was symbolic, by the way. That was a retrospective uh, uh, mention. In fact, they didn't say symbolic at all. Uh, I'll tell you, what, uh, now that I think back to that, uh, the theme of the training was first in the consensus decision making, which I was not, which is a process that I was not particularly familiar with, and that had been developed uh, a lot by uh, George Lakey and others at the, uh, at a Philadelphia group called, I forgot, uh, he's written a number of very good books, Strategy for a Living World or something, but people there have a community in Philadelphia, loosely associated with the Quakers, had developed uh, procedures a lot for group decision making that were very ultra-democratic and uh, allowed everybody to speak. And, um, tried to get consensus rather than majority vote so that a minority would not be feel ruled down or rejected and get everyone involved in the final action. <clears throat> and a lot, of uh, a lot of emphasis was put on the fact that the first step in this process was that we were going to sit on the tracks, spend the night of Saturday night. That was agreed to. The rally was Saturday. We'd walk out to the site, I think, didn't we walk out, as I recall, and um, <clears throat> then uh, we would sit on the tracks, blocking the tracks. And so it was a symbolic blockade of the plant, but it was not a symbolic civil disobedience action. We were, in fact, putting our bodies on these tracks, and should they choose to send a train, we would block that. But of course, the assumption was we would be arrested, we would be subject to arrest, but the assumption was we were risking arrest by this. We weren't pretending to risk arrest, we were risking arrest. Yeah. And um, were prepared to be arrested. So they went through the procedures of dealing with a lawyer and uh, what to do in jail and so forth, and how to maintain nonviolence in the risk of taunts or provocation of any kind, how to remain cool and nonviolent and non-provocative. And all this was very interesting. And uh, there were a lot of people involved who, who sat on the tracks that night and, uh, but, but then, uh, <laughs> well, the, the point was, though, that we would then have meetings. We were in affinity groups, I believe, and we would have meetings the next morning as to what to do next. Now, there was a, uh, some kind of a uh, teach-in or something scheduled the next day in Denver. And, of course, a lot of people were in support and, uh, on the action, were not sitting on the tracks. And then... Many, many others, of course, were just onlookers, in effect, who were against nuclear weapons, but they were at the rally and they, you know, they were not part of this action directly. So there was going to be a teach-in for such people, for anybody who could come in Denver. But it was definitely not uh, prescribed that we would end the action Sunday morning, uh, but rather that there would be a consensus about that. That would be, uh, much, was, much emphasis was put on the point. This is being done by consensus, and although this, this, this first step has, of course, been structured 
by the organizers, you know, uh, before we all got together. But once we were together, decision making from then on would be done by consensus, which we'd just been trained in. Procedures like if you really objected to a uh, particular decision, you could say, I block. One person could block, like a senator filibustering in the Senate. So each person had the power of a senator, in effect, to stop action so that there'd be further discussion until you reached a consensus. And the thing being that if you somewhat disagreed, but you would presumably withdraw your block, or you, would, but, or you wouldn't block, that a block was a, a last ditch kind of thing. Uh, but it was there as a possibility. Um, so, uh, all right, we went out, and as the afternoon wore on out there in the evening, as I recall, a, a rain started, which got heavier and heavier. So a lot of people left, naturally. And I think I had a, I, I later had, yes, I had for some reason a warm coat, which was much warmer than was necessary, which is carrying it because I'd just come from some relatively cold climates in Europe and elsewhere. So I had this fairly warm coat. So I put the warm coat on and then a garbage bag over the coat. I didn't have a raincoat. And I had this Stetson very happily. <laughs> so, uh, so I was really not to, uh, I was pretty well prepared, although I didn't have boots. I don't remember. I don't think I did. Uh, I may even have had boots, but I don't think so. The point being that the rain got very heavy and very, very cold. And I'd been out all night in the rain in the Marines uh, quite a bit in my three years. Um, but this was the toughest night as I remember ever being out in. And I, was, I wondered how many people could, could hold, stand this night because um, it was dark and couldn't really see how many were out there very well. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm all right here. I've got this rather heavy coat, but other people don't have that. And uh, I wonder if anybody will be here in the morning. Well, the morning came, and there were a lot of people still left there. They, this rain had winnowed down to a, to a hard core here, something of people. And I was very impressed that, that people would stay through the night at this. Uh, and the people on the tracks, I think, had now gotten down to about 29. There were a lot more s support people still around but the people right on the tracks. So at that point, I thought two things. Uh, first, it's Sunday morning. So um, the, work, the workers still weren't there. And uh, we hadn't gotten arrested, after all. So I thought, well, why, why uh, end the action now? I mean, if people are, are strong enough to stay on these tracks here, uh, let's make it a little longer action. And obviously, they are willing to get arrested. And uh, I think we had a meeting, a consensus meeting, and I think I raised the thought that uh, we should talk about whether we didn't want to stay here longer, at least till Monday. And I had a strong feeling, as I recall, it's a long time ago, that probably since they hadn't arrested us yet, they wouldn't arrest us during the day, but they would arrest us Monday morning when the, when the workers started to keep us from, just to get us out of the way. And um, so, Maybe it was at that point that about 29 others uh, said, yes, that was a good idea. And the, some of the organizers of the original protest at this point became quite agitated and uh, very disturbed that it was going this way. And I, I couldn't really understand that. I thought, what's the problem here? Uh, um, You'll have your teaching in town. You have a thousand people there. No interference. Twenty-nine of us will be here. What's, what's, what's the problem? And they seem to feel, well, we've had our action. But I really was quite puzzled by this because I thought, well, they've made such a point of we'll decide, and these people here deci have decided to stay. I mean, I hadn't made them stay, but it seemed like a good idea to me. And. Uh, I don't even remember whether, I suppose these people knew who I was because I'd spoken at the rally and I was quite well known at that time. But I, I, I no, I didn't have, I, I really was very determined at that point and later not to be a heavy on this and not to throw my weight around or say, I, you know, I just said as one of the people there, I think it would be good to make this a stronger action uh, here and stay a little longer and actually get arrested. And so, 
the, the thought became, uh, the idea began to be communicated in, well, but a lot of these people have sort of uh, understood that as long as we were here over the weekend, uh, we wouldn't, there wouldn't be an arrest, but then there will be an arrest on Monday. I said, well, fine, you know, <laughs> what's the problem? And, uh, uh, the, you know, the people staying there clearly were happy to be arrested. So uh, they seemed, as I said, surprisingly agitated about it. But I felt firm, I don't want to name names on this, but I felt firm, you know, if the people want to be here, I, I wouldn't have done it by myself uh, to be a lone adventurer here and trying to show up people, I'll stay on the tracks. I did, did not want that impression. Uh, but if there was, you know, five or six people who wanted to stay, or 10 or more, well, there were 29. So I thought, fine, that's a nice number, and uh, we'll just stay here. So uh, anyway, we, we stayed. Now this was a nice, I think Sunday now, was uh, the rain had stopped and it was a nice day again. So Monday came, and, uh, and as I say, some of the organizers were actually, uh, one of the women was actually crying with frustration at this. And as I say, I, I couldn't figure out what the problem was. And one of the things was, well, we're all, the action is going to be over after today after Sunday, and we've made all the plans for this, and we're going on vacation, we worked so hard on this, and I thought, well, all right, but, you know, go on vacation. <laughs> we're not asking you to stay around and help on the trial, we'll, we'll make out here somewhere or other. You've earned your vacation, go do it. And uh, so I, I really was perplexed by the, the controversy that seemed to be arising here. But uh, anyway, Monday came, and no arrest. Uh, and in fact, the uh, plant now put out, the Rocky Flats PR person, I haven't reviewed this stuff in the book, so I'm going just by memory here, but 25 years ago. But my memory is that the plant then around this time put out the word that they didn't need these tracks, really, that we were on an unused spur. And this is outside, outside the plant. The so that we weren't on the real track that was used uh, going and out. It's all right for these, that's why they weren't arresting us. Uh, these people can sit there if they want, you know, and so forth. And we asked around, we said, gee, is that the case? I mean, we didn't know, we just arrived here. Uh, we went to the tracks for people, <laughs> aren't these the tracks? And uh, so they really, all the newspaper men believed that, that women, they would come out and say, why are you sitting on this unused spur? But by this time, we talked to people around there and said, well, we don't believe that. <laughs> we think this is the track, <laughs> you know, actually, because people had told us there is no other track here. And the, uh, they also said that they, we'd learned, we'd heard, that they had to get this train in and out a couple times a week to, because otherwise the radioactive material would accumulate and would become too dangerous in there. Uh, for storage and everything. They had to get it out to store somewhere else. So the trains would come in and then go out with the, with the material. And uh, we had already heard that, that there was more danger than the plant admitted from this passage, uh, that the plant itself emitted a certain amount of venting and of, um, of uh, radioactive dust, and that there was some danger from being there, but, but uh, Dr. Mancuso, who had done studies of this at Hanford uh, emissions, had said that he thought that he'd told my wife and me uh, before this, that uh, he thought that a few days exposure on the track would probably not be too dangerous. And that the real problem was ingestion of particles. It wasn't being exposed to the skin so much, but if we ingested particles, then they would stay in our lungs and eventually would be a could kill us, depending how much we had. But, but a matter of a few days, the risk was not too great. However, having then mentioned, we'd mentioned that my wife was still nursing our child, who was just not yet a year old, he called back. This was Dr. Thomas Mancuso, who'd done major epidemiological studies of the radiation results of workers at the Hanford plant. By amazing coincidence or irony, my father had been the chief structural engineer on the buildup of Hanford from 1946 on, after the war, 
been used during the war, but uh, there was a huge expansion after the war. And he had been in charge of the building of that, but not of the uh, uh, radiation, uh, the cooling beds or whatever they used, the radiation, which had upset him. He, he had told me that he was very upset to learn that parts of his own country would be made uninhabitable by these tanks for forever, basically. In fact, he told me in his 80s, he said, for 24,000 years. And I remember saying, Dad, you have a very good memory. That's the half-life of plutonium. And the figure had stuck in his mind all this time from about 1948 when he left the project. So um, uh, here was uh, Hanford. It turned out that, yes, there had been contamination of the river and there had been a uh, radiation risk, which was directly proportional to proximity to the plant, which was presumably also true. And of course, Carl Johnson here, the health commissioner of Jefferson County, had found that to be true at Rocky Flats, for which news he was fired from his job. He was the enemy of the people in Ibsen's uh, term. Were you personally worried? Well, so I was. So here's what happened. Uh, I won't go into all this, but I decided that I would take that risk, that this was important enough to me to do that. Uh, but as I say, Tom Mancuso called us up afterwards in California and said, I've been thinking about what you said, that your, your wife is nursing your infant. She must not go near that, those tracks. She said, a nursing mother or an infant must not be exposed to that radiation because that would mean here I was at this point, uh, 47, I guess, and um, but a, uh, an, an infant getting this radiation through the mother's milk or directly ingesting it somehow would have that little particle in their growing bones that would have a much stronger effect like strontium-90 and uh, would live with it and die from it, essentially. So my wife did not go to the tracks with that warning. So we knew that there was contra. We didn't believe the assurances that the workers believed. I mean, we weren't being paid to believe that. Our living did not depend on it. We weren't, our houses were not, had not been mortgaged in that area. And so we knew that it wasn't but on the other hand, that it wasn't safe. But on the other hand, the risk seemed low. Um, we weren't there as long as the workers. We weren't living there and we weren't infants. So I thought of it as a risk, but not as a high risk and one that I was willing to take. Um, so uh, if I were to die of it, and it's almost too late for that now, uh, I could certainly not say I was not warned. Uh, and I, I did take that risk. But um, so the next step was that um, they having said that they're trying to get us off there by telling us the lie that we were on a spur, then the, and that it was not used, that they did not use that track. That was a direct lie. Now, when it came out that they had to arrest us, why? Because we were interfering with, this was after about a week, with the normal operation of the plant. How are we interfering? Because that track had to, that train had to go in and out. The Rocky Flats management now and the AEA had their credibility had a very sharp decline at that point, because the journalists had believed what they'd been told up to that point that they did not need to use that track, and that we were just sitting there if we wanted there. They didn't have to arrest us, and all of a sudden they did have to arrest us because they really did have to get that train in. So all of a sudden, the, the journalism on this changed quite a bit. But meanwhile, before that happened, uh, a terrific snowstorm had started. So there was not only uh, there was uh, snow, and uh, one day there was hail. And I was waiting for a plague of locusts uh, to come, you know, eventually. <laughs> it seems like <laughs> we were being tested somehow. But everybody was, uh, was staying there. And so when people uh, in Denver saw on their television that there were people out in this weather on that track, a caravan of cars came out, people we hadn't known, each individually. Nothing was organized. And as far as you could see, there was a long line. It's like a half a mile of cars filled with uh, uh, tents, ponchos, boots, actual expensive boots that they just left there, and rain boots, food, water, 
so much food we had a sep we each had a separate tent when we weren't on the tracks and uh there was a tent for food just to store the food and they had to put out a, a notice we put out a press release saying no more food and the, <laughs> the food stopped we had we had this consensus meeting of what to do with our surplus food who should we what charity should we give it to you know, so. and uh it was a, just a wonderful warm outpouring it was an amazing feeling you know to yeah, have this oh no, fabulous you know and, and we really all did get all we needed everybody got boots and ponchos and everything and um, because of course we'd come out in hot summer weather or spring weather so nobody had, had brought rain gear or uh, warm gear at all and uh, so it just showered on us uh, wonderfully and um, uh, so the question was how long shall we stay and I won't go through all that but there was a lot of consensus meetings as to because they were not in any rush to arrest us clearly they weren't arresting us and days went by and uh, one day it would be rainy and hailing and the next day would be hot and the question is well how, how do we get off this you know eventually do we have an excuse for getting off we've got a lives to go back to you know and stuff. so what how what should we say about how long we're staying and um as i recall uh one we finally thought jimmy carter is coming out to um address Rocky Flats, I believe. The, that's what it always comes back to me. The the uh, facility, this this uh, this campus of the University. No, wait, no, that's Livermore and Los Alamos are actually campuses of the University of California. But he was coming out to Rocky Flats and somewhere else, he, uh, maybe the University of Colorado or something. And but anyway, he was president. what was it? Yeah, he was president. So he was coming out, and he'd bring all the press with him. So we shouldn't leave before this great vast press corps comes. We should get our message out, you know, as much as well as we can. And um, we wanted to invite him to visit us on the tracks at Rocky Flats, among other things. And I forgot, and I won't go through all the details, and you can get them from anybody who was involved. But we sort of, we had to explain, uh, you know, how could we explain why we were there since we couldn't prove that the, that the Rocky Flats was lying, that they didn't need these tracks. And they were saying they didn't need them. So how to explain that we were there, and we had a little problem well we don't believe that but you know how far can you take that and we didn't believe it actually we, we, th we thought they were lying but we weren't sure I mean we couldn't prove it and uh, so I think finally we said so I think we decided internally that we would stay at least through this visit by Carter and uh, which by coincidence was just about to come up so I, I could go through lots of details, but the, what then happened was that on a, as I recall, a Thursday night, I, I could be wrong, I don't know, let's see, we started on April 29th, and I was just looking at that book again, and the first arrest was May 8th, so on the night of May 7th, uh, a heavy snow began to fall, but it turned out that the DOE my old colleague from the Rand Corporation, Jim Schlesinger, who is now head of the Department of Energy, had decided these people have to go because they had to use the track. <laughs> they, 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 they couldn't wait. They, they, of course, had hoped we would pack up and leave, and then the train could quietly come, and there would be no photographers there, and there would be no news. And, oh, well, they did have to use the track after all, but meanwhile, there would be nobody there. Well, they finally decided, get, we've got to get that train in. So... They did give the order. In fact, somebody told me later that uh, Jim Schlesinger had said to someone that his most satisfying act as Secretary of Energy had been to sign the order for the arrest of Dan Ellsberg. Remember, I'm the one who, <laughs> he was a Republican. <laughs> they hadn't gotten me, you know, <laughs> with the Pentagon Papers. So he was going to be the one, you know, finally put me behind bars. And um, so uh, we woke up that morning. And our tent had, had half collapsed, but all around us, the tents had totally collapsed under the weight of the snow, which turned out to be 36 inches. Now, a day before, it was no snow, it was hot, sunny, blazing, so we all had our pictures taken. And here this morning, April in <laughs> Colorado, <laughs> this 36 inches of snow began to fall, which was the heaviest snowfall we heard in 100 years in April 29th for that day. 
And now, nowadays, I mean, I can't impress anybody this month because they just had five and a half feet of snow. So three, three feet of snow is, you know, <laughs> nothing. So, but it was impressive uh, to us. And all the, uh, all the tents had collapsed. And uh, of course, you could put them back up again, but it was a very heavy snowfall. And at this point, the police began arriving. <laughs> to rescue us? No, no, they had made the decision already. And as they said later, well, if they know this snow is going to fall, they would never, you know, they would have waited another day. And we might very well have said, all right, <laughs> enough. <You know? laughs> Don't put the tents back up, we'll, we'll go. But, but no, instead, so they put us in the, in the police van with the pictures show us, you know, every, everyone's beard was frozen. There are a lot of beards in this group, not with me. And so all these frozen beards and frozen icicles and everything. And as I said, this is a rescue, basically, in the police van. And uh, so uh, we, they took us to a gym somewhere and booked us in. But, um, and that was May 8th. So that was the first arrest. Now, just going back, uh, I did hear later that, and I, I can't say I could prove this, and I certainly haven't seen documents on it, but I believed it at the time, and I believe it now. But a subject to counter evidence. Uh, if uh, somebody could prove this is not the case, I would happily accept that. But what I was told by insiders of the earlier action was that the organizers had made, of course they had, as is common in such cases, made negotiations with the police as to where we would be, and this is a good way to run an action, and no problem there. And negotiated with the plant, and they, you know, all this, to, so we weren't surprising them by what we were doing. And uh, after all, if they'd planned a, a train at that point, uh, uh, we wouldn't have wanted them not to know we were there, that sort of thing. So um, they, I think it was known that they'd been negotiating with everybody on the conditions, and that's very, that's almost always that is done. But uh, in this case, apparently, an agreement had been made with the plant uh, that they would leave on Sunday morning. And under those conditions, the plant had agreed, I mean, I'm sorry, the police had agreed, there would be no arrests. So in the minds of the organizers, it was to be a symbolic civil disobedience. And actually, if, um, if that had been known, assuming it to be the case, um, I don't think anybody would have been shocked by that exactly. Uh, there might still have raised the issue, well, maybe, we, maybe, is that a good idea? You know, now we're here, maybe we should rethink this or something. But if they'd really made a point that, well, we have this understanding and that's the action. Certainly, I have never uh, sympathized with people who hijack somebody else's action and uh, say, oh, you've planned it this way, but now I'm coming in and we're going to do it. I want to do it this way. If they do the organizing and they do the work, I'll follow their lead. But they did not, had not made that clear at all. What they'd said was that this is an action and whether it continues will depend on decision making. And I thought we'd made a decision those of us who stayed. And uh, they did say, well, there's consensus uh, that Sunday morning, but I said, well, consensus of who? I mean, who? The people who've gone back to Denver, or the people out here, or the people who are on the tracks? I mean, who, who makes this consensus? Well, that's, of course, not easy to define. That's, that's, a, that's a little <laughs> problem with the, with the process here, you know, because they hadn't circumscribed. You could have said uh, all the people who'd had the nonviolence training, it was a fair They'd taken all the precepts and you know, the vows and all that. But a lot of them had left already by this time. So I thought that the, the, it should be principle of those who were still there. And of course, after the rain that morning, there weren't a lot of people still there. So um, anyway, it turned out that the people who had originally organized the action did feel that we who stayed on the tracks had hijacked their action and had turned it into something other than what they had planned. And uh, that there was some very bad feeling, which I think persists in some people to this day, not in others. Others who were angry at us at the time, very quickly, after all, said, this is a good action on the tracks, you know, we didn't plan it, but it's good. And uh, were supportive. And others were just very angry. 
uh, still. So, uh, which I was sorry to hear. And uh, now we come back to one other point. Uh, I would not have quickly deferred on this particular one because uh, maybe I would have on the first day. Uh, but as I came to sit on those tracks, and, and maybe pretty early on, I realized this really is a very strategic location for symbolizing the general problem of the nuclear arms race and the neutron bomb in particular. This is where they make the triggers for the neutron bomb, specifically for the neutron bomb. And this is where they make all the triggers for, for, for nuclear weapons. Now, hardly anybody at this time would really know what I mean when I say a trigger for a nuclear weapon. I found at that time that if you ask an audience, what is the difference between an A and an H bomb? Usually in a crowd of 1,000 or 2,000, one or two people would raise their hands. And, or if you said an atom bomb or a hydrogen bomb, fission bomb or a fusion bomb, still it would be one or two or three or four. So I'd ask, one of, I'd ask then one of those, I did this all the time, what is the difference? And normally one would say, well, one is bigger. Which one? Often they'd say, I don't know. This is the level, by the way, of education at that time. And the nuclear freeze movement changed this level of education that came later uh, for a matter of years. I suspect we're back there now. I think I'd get the same answers as I got then. I, I suspect the education has gone way down. So I'd say, OK, which is bigger? Some would say the H-bomb. How much bigger? I don't know. That was the typical answer. I'd say, well, maybe this is the easiest way to convey it. Every H-bomb, which is the great majority of bombs in our arsenal, which at that time was like 30,000, the great majority of those are hydrogen bombs, fusion bombs, H-bombs, big or small. Every one of them has a Nagasaki-type bomb as its trigger. That's the trigger. Now, we've been hearing a lot during this Iraq war, partly to scare the Iraqis, it seems, but partly really, of a bomb called the, it, it's, its acronym is M-O-A-B, and they call it the mother of all bombs in mocking Saddam's old phrase of the mother of all wars. And it has, it means something else, I forget. B is for bomb at the end. But it's a very large bomb. It's 22,000 pounds of TNT, uh, or 11 tons of TNT. Now that's equivalent to the blockbuster, the largest bomb of World War II. Five to 10 ton bombs were called blockbusters because they would destroy approximately a city block of buildings with one bomb. So that's 10 tons, 11 tons. The Nagasaki bomb had the equivalent of 20,000 tons of TNT. So that one bomb was 2,000 times in explosive power, the largest bomb of World War II or of this war, the conventional bomb. That mother of all bombs, that 10 ton, would not trigger an H-bomb, but something like it would trigger a Nagasaki bomb, actually smaller. But high explosives, in other words, uh, trigger, in effect, the uh, Nagasaki bomb by imploding the plutonium, by squeezing it to a density that makes it greater than critical mass so that it explodes with a force of 10 to 20,000 tons of TNT. But that Nagasaki bomb is needed to start the fusion process in an H-bomb. And H-bombs, of course, come in lots of sizes. But the early ones are very large. I knew all this by this time, not as a physicist, but as somebody who had actually shaped war plans. I knew what our arsenal was. I knew what the ranges of our vehicles were. I knew, I knew the plans. I had helped write them. And what kinds of bombs you put on what kinds of targets. And the early H-bombs were very large. In fact, one of the first tested was 15 megatons, 
or 15 million tons of bombs, uh, tons of TNT. Uh, we had 20 megaton bombs in our arsenal, and that's 1,000 Nagasaki bombs. And although those are the largest, we had, the Russians had much larger ones. Um, these did exist in sizable, sizable numbers, and they are the early ones. When India and Pakistan develop H-bombs, if they haven't yet, there is a belief that India tried to test some H-bombs in their testing and uh, fizzled. None of our tests fizzled, uh, but that they, they didn't achieve the full fusion explosion. But if they renew testing, which they will if we do, and we will if this administration stays in office, we will resume testing of nuclear weapons. They virtually assured that. Then the Indians and Pakistanis will. They will then achieve an H-bomb. That will make a difference. It's the difference of moving from the A-bombs they now have, which would take a hole out of a city like Baghdad, as we took a hole out of Hiroshima or a hole out of Nagasaki. Much of the city, in fact, more than half of it remained in each case. An H-bomb on Baghdad, an early one, would leave nothing. It would, a city of five million people, 20 megaton bomb would kill five million people if it exploded. That's a holocaust in one bomb. So as uh, I said at that time, um, Rocky Flats contributes the detonators for H-bombs, which are portable Auschwitzes. Or as my son said, who got arrested on the tracks on May 12th. Rocky Flats is the Auschwitz of our time. And uh, he said, inside that building, men in white suits, or men with badges, men with business suits, whatever, going about preparing the implementation for the final solution to the human problem. Not because they want to do it, they want that to happen. They think they are deterring it from happening. But they are misled. He didn't say this, I'm saying this. The belief that we needed this to deter was and remained a delusion. I shouldn't say entirely a delusion, because after all, the, we, we fought the idea of a test ban for years. The Soviets did build up an arsenal. They did develop the power to destroy all life on Earth, including ours. But it was never true that we needed more to deter that. More than what? One, ten, a hundred warheads? Rocky Flats had produced more than 20,000 triggers. That's what we had. So it had no relation to needs of deterrence. And uh, still doesn't, of course. And against Baghdad, we probably won't use it now against Baghdad. That's almost out of the question, thank goodness. It's not at all out of the question that in the next month, the U.S. will use a nuclear weapon if Saddam did, whether he's dead or alive, did in fact have a thousand tons of nerve gas, as our president claimed, and if his successors use it, then Rocky Flats product may get used on people. And as I say, that will be horrible. So our protest, uh, what I said was, we are in the right place. I mean, that's what I said to myself. And uh, as I said last night, I was with some of the people from the Truth Force um, there, uh, I said something, I said, I, we don't all remember the details of this consent, endless consensus meetings in the tents. But I remember one that I took part in where I contributed to the naming of our group. But not, I didn't give the final name. We went around the circle, and this was one of the extreme raining days or snowing days or something, and we were sitting under plastic tarpon, tarp on the tracks, <clears throat> and we went around the circle telling our backgrounds and why we were there. And it was the first time I'd met people from Church of the Brethren. I'd never even heard of it before a pacifist religion, church, Christian church, like the Mennonites who were also there. 
And then Catholics, well, most Catholics are not pacifists, but people were there from the Catholic worker. And um, like my son, who arrived on May 12th from the Catholic worker house in New York. So uh, we went around and I realized that these were people who were living and believed from different backgrounds what I had come to understand in 69, nine years, or 68, 69, just 10 years earlier, when I'd started reading Martin Luther King, Gandhi, Joan Bondurant's The Conquest of Violence, Barbara Deming, Revolution and Equilibrium, and uh, Thoreau. So from that reading list, and then meeting people who were living that life and going to prison rather than uh, go to Canada or to the National Guard or to uh, Vietnam, uh, they went to prison to say, not with our consent, this is happening over our bodies. You have to put us in jail to pursue this war. Uh, that put the idea into my head that I could do more than I was then doing to help end the war. And uh, what I should think of is whatever I could do nonviolently and truthfully in the Gandhian principles, uh, assuming I was ready to go to prison. And among the things I thought of was, was copying the Pentagon Papers. So that had been now 10 years earlier for me. Then I realized these people had maybe grown up in Church of the Brethren or uh, others, and some not from a religious tradition, some Quakers, a very number of nonviolent, but all of them, including the ones who aren't religious, with a deep commitment to nonviolence as a way of life and a way for the world. And so that wasn't usually talked about. We said we're against the war, we're against nuclear weapons. And I said, this group, so I said, you know, when it came to my turn to speak, I realized listening to you that we share something from very different backgrounds. We are nonviolent. And maybe we should come out of the closet on that. Instead of, a pacifist is a bad word in American culture. You almost have to say, and I can say truthfully, actually, I'm not a total pacifist. I did support World War II, and I uh, still do the British gunners against German bombers, the Russians who fought even under Stalin against the German invasion. I think they were doing the right thing, not mistaken. They were doing what they should have done. I'm glad they did it. And I still say that, and so I'm not a total pacifist. But when it comes to social change or to saving the world, with anything but self-defense from violent attack, uh, I, I am deeply committed to nonviolence. And this was true of all these people on the tracks, clearly. So I said, maybe we should use a name that comes right out for once. And uh, I couldn't say we're pacifists, but it makes clear that we're nonviolent. Maybe we should use the name that Gandhi gave to his nonviolent actions, Satyagraha. Which, he, which translates as soul force or truth force. But satyagraha, that's what he called his actions. And so somebody said, well, that's, that's too foreign sounding and nobody will know what it means. So, forth. so somebody said, someone, not me, said, well, how about truth force? Rocky Flats truth force. And I think actually even the people there last night, I think very few people remembered how that arose or really knew what the name meant because truth force seems, well, truth force, good thing. But why truth force? After all, you know, we're, we're sitting in against nuclear weapons. What is truth? Why is that the essential word? And the essential word was this is nonviolent action to heal the world, to change the way things are, and to, uh, to speak the truth of our own spirit and our belief in the strongest way we can without threatening anyone, without using violence. Uh, and that is with our own bodies, with our own lives. Great. Just one quick question, and then our take will be over. Did, did this participation in this have a certain kind of meaning, or can you say, speak to what for me? Kind of impact it had for you, personally? Yes, well, <laughs> yes. Uh, First, my wife actually was at the time more resentful than I realized right away that I was 
the wife's leaving her alone with her little baby doing this. And uh, it caused a rift in our relations which took a long time to heal, but is very healed uh, long ago. We've been married for 33 years. But um, um, I realized that she didn't fully understand how deeply I felt about nuclear weapons. She, after all, got married to me in the context of the Vietnam War. And when the Vietnam War, which she was even more earlier, she was earlier opposed to than I was, and very happy to be my partner in opposing that, she didn't really know when she married me in 1970 that she had signed on to a lifetime of resistance to something else, to nuclear, nuclear weapons. So uh, that was difficult in my personal life. But I was committed, uh, whatever the costs. I, I should have, I, I regret that I hadn't made clearer to her exactly well, what, how, how deeply I felt about this. She didn't know my background on nuclear weapons or anything when we got married. Uh, she knew me in working in the Pentagon, which was bad enough. <laughs> and we had our problems with that, or in Vietnam. But uh, she didn't know about uh, my feelings about nuclear weapons. And uh, so the end is, so I, it was something I had to do to work this. But the truth force, being with these people, this deeply committed people who, who uh, just in many ways, if you, that was the happiest time of my adult life. I look back on that still at 72 now and can say, you people who are with me, they're my brothers and sisters. Uh, I always uh, feel absolutely bonded to them because uh, I loved being with them, and it was a happy time. Okay, I'll tell two stories okay. <laughs> I told last night. On May 8th, we were, we were arrested at Rocky Flats for, uh, in the great s snowstorm. And uh, there was a young woman there, uh, 17, Marion Daub. Uh, in fact, I urge you to interview her parents who are in this area, uh, Bill and I forget. Uh, forgotten her mother's name at the moment. But, um, and Bill had been part of our effort, and so had Marion. So uh, when we were all arrested, I remember being in the gym, and she was on the phone to her mother, and she, said, she came back to me crying, and we were being signed, you know, we were being booked in. And she said, uh, my mother says, I can't do any more of this. Uh, because it's, our tests are coming up, final exams are coming up. Um, she was for high school. And she said, uh, enough arrests, you know, and so forth. Uh, get back to your books and uh, take your exam. So I can't, can't do any more actions. And I said, well, Marion, that's, that's all right. You know, I'm, I have a daughter your age, just about. And um, I think you're right. You should, um, you'll have plenty of time in the rest of your life. And now is the time to maintain your relation with your parents. Know, and do what they want here, and you're fine with the exams, so don't worry about it. So it continued to snow for a while, then, and all through the next day, I think. So we got 36 inches of snow. Sunday morning, in the, in the middle of the night, Saturday night, I woke up thinking, wait a minute, the tracks are not occupied now. And I know they arrested us because they needed to get a train back in there. They wouldn't have arrested us otherwise. So, uh, they must be about to get a train in there, and there's nobody on the tracks. So I got on the phone, it was about four in the morning, called everybody and said, let's, let's get everybody who can get together very fast here, and let's get back on those tracks. So before the train comes, if we can. Well, it's Sunday morning now. It was not easy to get people together. But they actually, somebody knew somebody who had a, uh, ran a ski shop here, because we now 36 inches of snow, there was no way to walk back to those tracks. And uh, so the ski shop opened on Sunday morning. And not only did they open and give us snowshoes and skis and other equipment, but they gave them free, uh, rented. You know, Well, it was a little dangerous because if we got arrested, as we did, of course, the police confiscated this stuff for at least a while. So um, they didn't let us go into the jail with uh, skis on. So uh, they actually, the ski shop gave us the skis. And we got back. It was a wonderful operation. We trudged through the snow. I, mean, I won't go through that whole story. It's a wonderful story, actually. And to cut it short, uh, 
a day or two later, we'd been ordered that we'd been told we'd be arrested if we stayed on the tracks, and we had a quick consensus meeting, and we stayed on the tracks. But they didn't, uh, didn't arrest us, after all, right away. So then somebody said, the train is coming. We were up on a hill at that point, off the tracks, in, what, in, a, in, a, snow, in, a, in a windstorm that had... <laughs> It was an amazing night. It blew almost all the tents down, so we spent the night holding on to these things. And at one point, uh, actually, I went out to, uh, to try to hold the, the tent down from outside in this tremendous uh, wind. And the, there were, the, the snow had now become icy on top of the snow. It was not snowing. And I began, I was pulled away from the tent, and I began sailing across the, with my heavy coat on, toward the, the fence, uh, actually. And the, the policeman in charge had frequently told us that uh, there was no problem, uh, there would be no violence or anything if they had to arrest us outside the tracks, but if we, on the tracks, but that if we, if we, if we got to the fence or over the fence, uh, they would have to shoot us. And I remember sailing toward this fence and sort of like shouting into the wind, I can't stop! <laughs> Anyway, I finally, I think, crawled back practically to this fence, and the tents had been blown down. Effectively. So here was everybody in the morning, and then the train is coming. So we rushed down this thing to the tracks, and they had, in fact, cleared off the tracks. Some plow had been through, and there was a train chug chugging along. Not chugging, it was diesel, I guess. But it was coming along slowly along these tracks. So uh, we had time to get down the gully and onto the track, and a guy named Jay Dillon, who was uh, very long red hair, I remember, down his back, put his head on one track and his feet on the other, as he said later, so that he wanted to be sure he couldn't run away. And Forrest Williams, the philosophy professor that I mentioned to you, <laughs> knelt beside him, a guy named Butch Wade, who I remember because we were all trudging, we were skiing across the, a couple of days before across the snow to um, reach these tracks. We looked over, and there was a figure coming across the snowbanks, Butch Wade, with an American flag he was carrying. We'd left the flag back um, at, at uh, somewhere, so he brought the flag out to us. So he sat down with his flag. On the, thing. the train is coming at us at this point, and so we all sat down on the tracks. And uh, uh, the train comes slowly, giving us time to think, you know, each of us a little bit. What are we going to do? What's, what's going to happen here? What's, what's next? And uh, of course, we assumed that they didn't want to run us over. But had they practiced stopping? <laughs> Did they really know <laughs> how long it took for them to stop? Well, they weren't going very fast. Um, or might they play chicken with us? You know, just keep going, let us jump off. As happened, after all, with Rachel Corey uh, recently uh, in Israel in front of the bulldozer. She wasn't threatening the bulldozer, and probably the bulldozer didn't mean to run over her, but it, it uh, kept going, and she slipped backwards, and she was run over by the bulldozer. And my friend Brian Wilson did have his legs cut off on the tracks, uh, and the train, in that case, was playing chicken. They did mean the Concord Naval Station uh, when these people were protesting the Contras, they meant to let them jump off, and Brian didn't jump off, and he lost both his legs. So, and my wife and I uh, went on those tracks the next day, because I woke up at, and his blood was on the tracks. And um, I said to Patricia at uh, six in the morning, I think I've got to go on those tracks. And she said, I, I know, I've been, I've been thinking the same thing. And she went out there with me too. And that day they didn't send a train. So, this, that was years later. So, on these tracks, here the train is coming, and then it did stop. And out of the train comes a whole line of police toward us, which had a very, had a feeling, a very reminiscent feel to it. It was like the scene in Butch Cassidy in the Sundance Kid, where this train comes along and then stops, and then a whole bunch of armed horsemen leap out 
from the train of the posse, you know. The super posse comes after them, it's like Butch Cassidy. And apparently the troops and the, and the police in the train had seen the same film, of course. And they were all saying to each other in the train, this is just like Butch Cassidy, <laughs> and so forth. And they were in the train so they could get through the snow. They didn't have to walk through the snow. So they arrested us again and so forth. And that night, um, it, it took a long time to book us all, so uh, we weren't, uh, we were getting booked late at night, arranged, and uh, in the night I was getting fingerprinted, and I look up and there are two women being fingerprinted, and one of them is Marion Daub, a 17-year-old. I said, Marion, what are you doing here? Because I knew she had, wasn't supposed to be part of this action. She said, well, she had been home from school, it was a school day, and she was watching the television and saw that we'd been arrested again and that there was no one occupying the tracks anymore. So she felt she had to come out and, and renew the occupation. And, uh, and, and she'd been walking along the tracks with this other woman and they walked along the tracks in the darkness holding hands, this was later testified in court, and singing, we shall overcome and we will not be moved. And they saw this light coming at them in the distance. And of course, she hadn't, uh, she'd been with us on the first arrest, but there was no train. This was the first train to come through since we'd first occupied. So they see this light and the light gets bigger and bigger and it's a train coming at them. So they knelt down, this was later testified, they knelt on the tracks and the tracks stopped and they, they went limp and they were arrested. So my head was spinning, I hadn't had any food all day all day, I guess, and uh, uh, it was a long day, and I was trying to take this in, and I said, Marion, you stopped the train again by yourself? She said, well, yes. I said, who's your friend? She said, my mother. So, as her mother testified, she said it was an unusual mother-daughter action, but um, she felt I shouldn't let the young people take all the burden. So, um, uh, anyway, what were you going to say? Oh, you were saying these were the people that I was with. And the reason I'm here this week is because um, my friend Evan Fryrish, who was, got arrested with his then, was one of the original Rocky Flats people first suggested that I come out for a reunion, 25th reunion, just about now. And then they decided not to have a reunion, but would I come out and talk in Boulder against the Iraq war? And would be a chance to meet with uh, other members of the task force, which I will be doing immediately as soon as we turn off the camera here. And so I leaped at that chance. And the reason being, I say, these weren't ordinary. Because uh, none of us, <coughs> excuse me, none of us talked about it at the time, but I did, I did ask one, and then I asked a couple other people, what had you decided to do if the train kept coming? And the two people I asked each said, I decided I wasn't going to get up. And that's what I decided. So I thought, this is the time, this is the place. And if it has to be over our bodies, let it be over our bodies. So, we didn't discuss that. I think these two people were the only people I just mentioned that to. And I don't know what the others thought. But, as I've said to Evan and said to other people here, that month on the tracks was the happiest time of my life my adult life, is being with those people in that spirit and that decision was a very, very happy time.